So we've looked at the little bit of the spirit of awakening, bodhicitta, its benefits, how it transforms this body, this unclean body in a sense, into uh, something marvelous, into something meaningful. And then we've looked at how uh, what comes in the way of that is our uh, negativity, unwholesomeness that we've created, and that due to the uh, truth of death and impermanence, we have to get moving immediately to work on that, to destroy that negativity, because we don't know when we're going to die. All we know is that death is definite, that we're going to die, and that we're going to die alone, and that no one can take us by the hand and deliver us into heaven or some good place. We have to, having generated regret, we have to uh, eradicate that negativity ourselves because the Lord of Death is not going to wait for us to uh, do what we have to do. We have to therefore engage in that right now. Mm. So uh, Shantideva is really telling us to wake up and to uh, not, uh, not delay. What tends to make us delay is three different factors. I might as well mention now. Well, many factors, countless factors. The three types of laziness are spoken about in the Dharma. Usually as obstacles to joyous effort or meditation, but we might as well mention them here. Anyone remember any of them? Pratima, you should remember one of them. You've heard this teaching at least three times. Procrastination. Huh? Procrastination. Yeah, procrastination, which comes from the Latin. Procrast, pro. So to what you can do today, why do it today? Let's do it tomorrow, you know. And then that becomes tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Oh, Bob, welcome, welcome. And uh, then that becomes when I'm older, when my kids have grown up and blah, blah, blah. And then death comes and then it's too late. So procrastination, delaying, delaying, having no need to delay non-virtue, being very, very quick in accumulating non-virtue and doing mundane things, but uh, procrastinating in terms of practice of uh, dharma, but having no difficulty in procrastinating uh, when it comes to watching the uh, recent Arsenal match against whoever, or one's favorite hobby, that we can do, no problem. But when it comes to dharma, then a problem. Yeah, relax, Bob, you'll be cool in a minute. Don't put on the fan. No. Yeah. So then, that's the first kind of laziness. The second looks like it's not laziness because the next one refers to people being very, very, very busy. But what are they being busy at is worldly things. So busy in all the sort of things we do, you know, wheeling, dealing, cleaning things incessantly, making money, shopping, going to movies, again and again and again, you know, engaging in worldly activities with tremendous energy, tremendous energy. Or if we're business people, very competitive, cutthroat, you know, business people, uh, you know, so much to be done, so much to be done if you are uh, in, in politics, you know, to undermine the opposition, to, you know, to, to help your own uh, people, your own party, all sorts of things that we're doing all the time just for ourselves in our little circle, just to survive and to gain influence, power. Uh, you could say to be involved in the eight worldly dharmas, the eight worldly feelings that are spoken of, being very attached to four things, uh, gain, pleasure, good reputation, and praise, and being very upset and trying to avoid at all costs loss, uh, suffering, any kind of unhappiness or discomfort, uh, blame, and bad reputation. So our whole life revolves around these eight things, trying to get four things, trying to avoid for the other things. So gain and loss, praise and blame, pleasure and pain, good reputation, bad reputation. Trying to get four of those, trying to avoid for the other four. That's our life. Think about it. Always trying to get some kind of pleasure, trying to avoid suffering, trying to get gain being very upset if there's any kind of loss, all of this. That's what our life is. And we're very busy doing that. That's another form of laziness. And looked at from the dharma perspective, it's totally lazy because we have no time left for authentic uh, spiritual practice. 
you know, we might read something because a friend, you know, buzzes us or sends us a WhatsApp message and says, wow, you should, you know, you should look at Shantideva. So then for a few days in our life, we look at Shantideva and say, that's okay, you know, but, you know, the new Chetan Bhagat look, book looks a bit more interesting and, you know, whatever. Oh, well, you know, whatever it is. I don't want to put down all these authors, but um, we might think that something else is much better than Shantideva, you know, something very worldly. So then, for a couple of days we were interested, then we forget it, go back to the old patterns of um, eight worldly feelings. Getting, you know, some kind of stimulation and uh, avoiding any kind of, uh, you know, discomfort, being terribly upset and worried, of, you know, whether one will get chikungunya or dengue, killing every mosquito in sight, being paranoid about, you know, so many things because of the atmosphere of fear which can easily be generated because we're so attached to ourselves and our bodies and our health and all the rest of it, you know? So I'm not saying we shouldn't look after our health. I'm saying we get paranoid about these things and uh, then it just messes up our happiness and calm. So there's no space for real dharma in the mind. This is what we're doing. So Shanti Deva is saying, wake up out of this and uh, begin to practice because with this boat, as he says, this boat of a human body, he says, cross over the ocean of suffering to the island of liberation. Don't waste this human body on what basically every animals do, which is just looking after your health and uh, your, your body and eating, drinking, reproducing, making your nest. Animals do that. We don't need to do just that. We can do a little bit more than that, he's saying which is what all of the spiritual teachers say, right? We need a home, we need food, lodging, we need uh, comfort, we need some, most people need some attention from a partner or something, but we can also engage in some Dharma practice, authentic investigation using the power of mind. Mm. And if we were, to have a long-term perspective, really begin to have a feeling for future lives, then we would see how what we're doing now is kind of, we'd be able to put it in perspective in the long term. We'd say, what is it? In the long term, what is it? To just be having, trying to accumulate a circle of people who like me and care for me and pushing away other people I don't like, it becomes meaningless when you look at the long, long-term picture. It, ju it just, uh, these thing, this way of thinking puts these things into perspective. So we don't get too caught up in short-term projects and worries and uh, uh, categorization of people, conflicts with people, you know, based on very short-term aims, you know, like that. <clears throat> so, The end of that second chapter ends with uh, beseeching the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to accept that I've done wrong. I, I declare it in front of you. Uh, I shall try not to do it anymore. Yeah. Then chapter three, very, very upbeat and very joyful chapter, because in this chapter there, it's called the full acceptance of the awakening mind. So here there's a rejoicing in this mind that uh, has been generated and spoken about in the first chapter. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, if we can be happy about, say, cleaning our car or cleaning our teeth or maybe we have wax in our ear, we cle clean our ear out, we feel a certain happiness. We feel a certain happiness at mundane things. Imagine the kind of happiness that a person feels when they really have that joy and the, uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the joy and bliss of a mind, the positive energy of a mind that is just not at all stressed out or uptight about me anymore. It's gone beyond that obsessive, compulsive concern about I, me, mine. You know, and is able to reach out and work for others, you know, without that grasping, that being in chains that we spoke of earlier. Just is able to open up to others, work for others happily, you know, and have this very positive energy in one's mind all the time. 
So just as the happiness that a mother feels when seeing her only child, this is the kind of happiness and affection, affection that the Bodhisattva feels when he or she sees other beings. There's one part of the development of Bodhicitta where we try to see all sentient beings as like our mother, meaning here it is actually taken literally that beings have been my mother in past lives, countless past lives, or countless mothers were necessary. So everyone around us now has at some point been our mother. But not only that, just seeing their present kindness, then the Bodhisattva feels tremendous, you know, sort of uh, affection and love for whoever they see, whoever they come in touch with. It's just tremendous, this warmth. Imagine, you know, think now about how you feel when you see a very long, long lost friend, someone you haven't seen for a long time, you know, very close, you're, you're very close to them, you still feel very close to them, you haven't seen them for many years, what happens when you meet them? This happened to me just a few days ago in Bombay. It was so, so lovely to meet this person whom you were a friend with, you know, almost half a century ago, and still there's that strong feeling of um, friendship and affection. So when, when you see this person, when you meet that person, you feel so happy, you know. So here it's kind of saying the Bodhisattva feels similar, feels affection for all beings, because they have generated their mind, reflecting on the kindness of others and on the suffering that others go through and how I depend on others, you know, and how they want the same as I do, which is happiness, you know. Having done that powerfully again and again, not just once, again and again until the mind is totally transformed. Uh, so then the Bodhisattva feels this tremendous uh, happiness, uh, almost you could say, or thinking, wow, these all so, they're so close to me. Like the Dalai Lama, often when he meets people, he refers to them as my old friends. I, he says, I regard everyone I, I meet as an old friend. Because I, I, I also feel quite proud of whom I met the other day. I don't know whether I should tell you. Not the Prime Minister. Um, you've heard of Yes Bank, right? Yes Bank. So the CEO and Managing Director of Yes Bank, uh, you know who it is, right? Uh, he's my best childhood friend. Best friend. Best friend. Lived next door to me. Oscar. When I left to go back to England in 1966, uh, and he'd been my best friend, right, for five, six years. It's when I was saying goodbye to him that I started crying. Because I realized that oh, what a, you know, now I'm going, and now I'm leaving, you know, leaving my best friend. So I'm going back. So I was crying, you know. So I got into the taxi to go to Palam. There was only Palam in those days, it was like an old bus station at the Bodh Um So yeah, when I saw him again, in Bombay a few days ago. Of course, I'd seen him once or twice, very briefly in between. But it was so nice. It's like that old friendship revived immediately, immediately. So I'm not saying that's the Bodhisattva attitude. I'm saying Bodhisattva is more than that, because the Bodhisattva doesn't just get caught in the pleasure of meeting an old friend. The Bodhisattva sees all beings as deeply, deeply uh, close to them and kind, and uh, sees the suffering. So that affection is always mixed in the Bodhisattva's mind with compassion, seeing the suffering of others, wanting to uh, guide them out of their suffering, which is the meaning of compassion, right? The definition is the wish for others to be free of their suffering. So then working at that, working to free others from their suffering based on affection and love and remembering their kindness. So that kind of mind, imagine having that kind of mind even towards people whom now you don't like or get very annoyed at, you could still get annoyed. It doesn't mean bodhisattvas don't get annoyed at people, but they never lose their love and compassion for that person. One of my first teachers, Lama Yeshe, yeah, Lama Yeshe, who founded this organization and all, he told one student, I don't like you, my dear, I don't like you, but I love you. <laughs> Matlab, you're not a very likable person. I'm not going to invite you every day to tea or something, but I love you. Meaning, I feel affection for you, I want you to be happy. I'm going to work for your happiness, that's the meaning of love. But I don't like you particularly, because, you know, whatever. So like that, 
we don't have to love uh, like everybody some people aren't that likable you know let's face it scorpions and certain kind of animals or people aren't that likable I mean I don't know uh, some people you see on TV you never know how they are when you meet them you might quite like them but say they're not likable you can still love them want them to be happy I mean sincerely I can say in part of my mind wants Donald Trump to be happy although I don't appreciate his um, is uh, what I hear him saying, you know. I don't appreciate I wouldn't want to spend a lot of time with him probably, but I can say, yeah, okay, I want him to be happy. Perhaps if he was a happier person, he might be a you know, better, better candidate for president. Anyway, so like that, we can, we can begin to think in the way that uh, a bodhisattva might think. That's not difficult to begin to think that way. It just needs a bit of reasoning and uh, logic analysis of the situation. Stop seeing things just one-sidedly. It's quite possible. One doesn't have to be highly intelligent or greatly compassionate to begin to think in this way. So then that's very useful. Okay, so here in chapter 3, this awakening mind is being uh, rejoiced in. Gladly do I rejoice in the virtue that relieves the misery of all those in unfortunate states and that places those with suffering and happiness. So it's like here the Bodhisattva, as we mentioned, not just relieving people of some poverty or hunger, although that is also what Bodhisattvas may do. This is relieving the misery of having to stay in samsara through the power of ignorance, anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Helping beings be free of those destructive emotions. Yeah? So that kind of positive intention and that skillful means that the Bodhisattva uses, that incredibly charged mind of compassion. Here Shantideva is rejoicing in that. What does rejoicing mean? Well, it means basically remembering good things, positive things, virtuous things, remembering them, then lifting up one's heart and rejoicing, thinking how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is, how amazing. This is how our teacher describes it, and I think it's quite useful. Uh, for me, those words are useful. You might want to use other words or other language, but you know, to think of the good things people do or the, the good things one has done or something like this awakening mind, to think that some people have generated it, you know, how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is, how amazing, how amazing that somebody could have such a mind that thinks about others' happiness. In the first chapter, which I didn't quote here, Shantideva says, if, if, if even the thought to relieve somebody of a headache is a good intention, then what to mention someone who wants to release people from all of their suffering completely? What can you say about that? It is just so amazing, you know? Um, I think it's in the first chapter. Uh, yeah, he also says, you know, how can I fathom the depths of the goodness of this jewel of the mind? the panacea that relieves the world of pain and is the source of all its joy. If even the thought to relieve living creatures of merely a headache is a beneficial intention endowed with infinite goodness, then what need is there to mention the wish to dispel their inconceivable misery, wishing every single one of them to realize boundless good qualities of, you know, of Buddhahood and so forth. You know, this is very clear. What an amazing mind. I don't just want to relieve people of have temporary headaches and poverty and lack of food or lack of friends. Of course I want to do that, but not just that. I want to relieve them of every misery and help them develop boundless good qualities, which will help them to transcend samsara, become bodhisattvas and buddhas who can then act as guides for the world. How wonderful. How wonderful that is. You know, we see people benefiting others in various ways and we think how great, how great that they're helping others. You know, even small things can be so wonderful when you see somebody sharing their food with someone. There was once a uh, video, I think it was real, not manufactured, of this tramp, this poor tramp, obviously quite miserable and uh, living by begging and such. And... Uh, showing him coming out, uh, sitting there, someone gave him something, he immediately shared it with this uh, dog, 
who was there, gave a lot of his food to the dog who was hungry. It was just something, you know, just something very moving, and um, it just shows that we can all be extremely, uh, benef you know, helpful for others and kind. So when you see something like that, you just immediately want to rejoice. You know how wonderful it is. How wonderful it is. So it's said that by rejoicing, and it makes sense, your own positive energy becomes very much charged. You know, it's very, very positive energy is generated. Punya, merit, if you like, is very powerful is generated in one's own mind by rejoicing. I rejoice in that gathering of virtue that is the cause for the arhat's awakening. I rejoice in the definite freedom of embodied creatures from the miseries of cyclic existence. I rejoice in the awakening of the Buddhas and also in the spiritual levels of their children. And with gladness I rejoice in the ocean of virtue that comes from developing an awakening mind that wishes all beings to be happy, as well as in the deeds that bring them benefit. Wonderful. So, whatever. So Rinpoche says you should rejoice first in your own past goodness, which has brought you to this good human rebirth. Really rejoice in all the good things you must have done. Then rejoice, thinking how wonderful it is in all the things you're doing now, which are positive. And then rejoice in all of the future actions, which no doubt you will do in the future, you know, that are beneficial and uh, helpful and dharmic. Think how wonderful it is. And then do the same for your spiritual friends, <coughs> your buddies in the dharma. Because often we have jealousy and competitiveness and stuff. So here he's saying, just rejoice in that. Think how wonderful it is. Remember, I always says, especially to small children in schools, if you're jealous, it just creates cause for your own unhappiness, one, plus it leads to your lack of success. But if you can rejoice in the good things and what your fellow students have that you don't have or any other good qualities, it just creates happiness in your own mind immediately, plus it's a cause for future success. Makes sense, you know. It, it leads to immediate happiness, rejoicing. Whereas jealousy is, a, as you know, or envy is a very unpleasant, uh, disturbing state of mind. Not a happy state of mind. So this is a direct antidote also to envy and jealousy. You know, because we feel so, you know, not good about ourselves, then it's easy to feel jealous or envious. So we should just learn to immediately rejoice in the good fortune, and it could be anything. Others are more healthy, younger, more handsome, more beautiful, more rich, more wise, more whatever. Whatever, fantastic. How good for them. How wonderful it is. How wonderful it is. Just rejoice. It'll become a habit soon. <laughs> so then one won't feel unhappy anymore when we see things that formerly made us unhappy because we compared ourselves with others and felt bad and therefore developed jealousy, envy. So we should just have that positive energy going in our life, then it's very powerful. And, and, the, and, and the cause of immediate peace in the mind and happiness, and it creates tremendous positive energy. So then Ramesh says, after that, then you uh, rejoice in the beings who are like developing uh, morality, concentration, wisdom, you know, uh, the nirvana path, which is wonderful. They're working so hard to develop those qualities. And then you, of course, uh, generate great rejoicing in the bodhisattvas, those who have given up just caring for themselves, who care for others only. You know? and, and then your gurus and the buddhas and bodhisattvas, they're inconceivable, wonderful actions. Also in between, he says, you should uh, think about the great beings and saints of other traditions, not just Buddhist, you know, whoever they are from other traditions, uh, Ramakrishna, Christ, uh, there's so many people. And so rejoice in their achievements. St. Francis of Assisi, very favorite with our teacher. He loves St. Francis. So people like that, <clears throat> obviously given up attachment to the worldly life and benefit others, even animals. So like that, <clears throat> rejoice in all these things. So it's, uh, you know, a very wonderful practice. Nagarjuna, also the great, the great scholar, yogi, who um, wrote so much about uh, on wisdom. He greatly praises rejoicing also in some of his um, texts. With gladness, yeah, 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 yeah. With folded hands, then, so that is what is called the first of the, uh, the first of the seven limb practice. There's a seven limb practice, uh, which also we'll be doing tomorrow at Buddha Jayanti Park. Uh, there's an event there. We'll be doing the uh, seven limb practice which is a, the uh, preliminary to developing this uh, mind of awakening.
traditionally. Um, so here, first, uh, <clears throat> this is one of the, uh, this is not the first limb. The first limb is prostrating, the seven, second limb is offering. And then the third limb is uh, confession of faults, the di disclosure of evil. And the fourth limb is, is actually rejoicing. Fourth limb is rejoicing. Then uh, the uh, fifth and sixth la uh, limbs or parts of that prayer are connected with asking all the Buddhas to remain and to teach. So in other words, requesting the Buddhas not to go into nirvana, but actually to stay and teach us. So with folded hands, I beseech the Buddhas of all directions to shine the lamp of dharma for all bewildered in misery's gloom. So this is the verse that you recite here at uh, Tibet House when Geshe asks people to light the lamps at the beginning of, uh, of the session, this, ver this verse is chanted again and again. With folded hands, I beseech the Buddhas of all directions to shine the lamp of dharma for all who are bewildered in misery's gloom. So we are like bewildered. We are confused in the darkness of misery, of suffering. Three kinds of suffering, right? Right? Pratimaji, I'm picking on you today. What's the first level of suffering? Suffering of change, suffering. Ah, first one. First suffering one. Suffering. Huh? Suffering of suffering. Ah, what does it mean? Ah, ji, computer ke samne zade baat rahe hain aajkal. Ah, suffering of suffering. Means just headaches, pain, fear, not enough, whatever, food, hungry, thirsty broken leg, broken heart, sometimes that's also in that uh, category. Then second is what? Suffering of change. Yeah, what does that mean? Suffering of change? Huh? good things change and we feel not so good. <laughs> <laughs> So suffering of change means what we consider happiness, Buddha says is suffering. Meaning, we think that having lunch is very wonderful. And it was very wonderful. When I started eating, it felt very wonderful. I was a bit hungry, and so it felt very wonderful. Halfway through, I realized there's too much mm -hmm. on this plate, on this thali, plastic thali, and it became less pleasant. I wouldn't say it turned into deep suffering by the end, nothing like that. I don't have uh, stomach ache, but there was the suffering of dissatisfaction and just not finding it uh, you know, so tasty by the end because my stomach was already full. So good things change by their nature. And even if I was extremely hungry, even if I was a 20-year-old and extremely hungry, how much can you eat? You know? How much can you eat? At a certain point, you'll feel great suffering if you just keep on eating. In other words, eating is not a pure source of happiness. That's all it's saying. It cannot give final satisfaction. There will be dissatisfaction connected with eating, drinking, going into the shade when you're hot and coming out of the shade when you're cold. All these things change. Everything. Relationships. Everything is actually in the nature of unsatisfactoriness. cannot give lasting satisfaction. Meaning long term, very long term. It can't because it will change anyway. You can't be with a person more than 70, 80, 90, 100 years, you know. I don't know if any people have celebrated 100th marriage anniversary. Maybe some people have, I don't know. But even then, what happens after 100? You're decrepit and dead you know, after a while. So even that changes. So that's the point. That's an, 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 and the third level of suffering? Huh? The most important. Most important. Aji, Avi. Vijayji, huh? Well done, sir. Yeah, What's the meaning of yeah, all pervasive <laughs> suffering? <laughs> like, for example, uh, in my previous life, I was inclined to killing. Uh -huh. Then I have the same instinct in this life. That's interesting. That's one part of it, yeah. What they're saying here is that our lives, our body and mind of this life is has a contaminated source, which is delusion and karma. So based on ignorance, attachment, anger, which we've had since beginningless time, we've created the killing, as you say, and all the other things. And that keeps on creating the causes and the effects of suffering. Cause of suffering, and then we have the effect of suffering, again and again, in body and mind. We've created the cause. That's all pervasive because it just conditions everything. It's all, it's, you could say, an all pervasive conditioning. 
and not conditioned by something beneficial, conditioned by delusions and karma, delusions being ignorance, anger, attachment, and so forth. They, they are what they are the fuel for this particular life that we have. Most of us in this room, maybe all of us, haven't been born according to our wish. You know, we weren't born perhaps with the intention to benefit. We were just born due to the karma throwing us into the particular, you know, to particular parents. Not to our choice, not because we wanted to come back in this world necessarily to benefit others, uh, but just karma, you know, the winds of karma. So, and then we have all of these um, afflictive emotions in the mind and karmic seeds, which only need a tiny stimulus and we get attached, angry, jealous, blah, 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 you know, confused. So we are dominated by these elements, so that is a deep suffering. That's the cause of all the other sufferings having this contaminated body and mind. So we might say this third level is the five aggregates or the body-mind combination conditioned by delusion and karma and therefore going around in circles.